G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of Life Studies. Today, we'll be looking at Spiritual Warfare, the part four. I pray that this will, this will be a benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. Okay, so we're looking at Spiritual Warfare, the, the fourth part of it. Uh, last time, we looked at the third front in Spiritual Warfare, and that's the world system, world system around us. Uh, who's in control? Satan's in control of the world system. Uh, what, what's the world system about? Well, it's ignorant of God's wisdom. It's, it's also the world system is set apart for judgment and the world system wars against the truth of God. We still live in this, in this earthly world, but uh, we're actually not, no longer part of this world's nature. We have a different, we have a different we're, because we have a new spirit. We're uh, born again of the spirit, therefore we don't have to partake of this world system. We've been separated from the world with our new birth. Now, what's the obligation of the, of the believer? Well, obligation is do not love the world system. Do not fellowship with the world in the areas of the deeds of darkness. We are supposed to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. So we, what does that mean? It means that we refuse to participate in the sins that the world might want us to participate in. Uh, we're told not to abuse the things of the world. What does that mean? It means don't become attached to the world's values. Um, what do we know about the world system? Well, the main battleground with the world system is our mind. That's the main battleground in regard to the world system. The mind is the place, our minds are the place of war with the world. Why? Because our minds are being well, they're trying to program us to think the way the world is thinking. Uh, and, and so what, what are we commanded to do? We're commanded to not to be conformed to this world. We're commanded to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, so our responsibility then is to be transformed by renewing our mind. How do we do that? Well, we need to have the mind of Christ and you, you have the mind of Christ. First thing you need to do is to be born again of the spirit need to place your trust in Jesus Christ as your savior. Once that's done, you then have to, we then should be, uh, we then should be uh, um, uh, meditating upon the scriptures, looking into, digging into the scriptures, learning from them so that we can then begin to understand the deep things of God. That's the mind of Christ, to be able to understand the deep things of God. We need to control our thought life. We need to also meditate upon the word of God. Now, how do we do that? Well, we need to memorize scripture, memorize passages of scripture and then turn them over in your mind, you know, the days at a time until you, you virtually suck the life out of it. Um, we also looked at what happened at the cross because at the cross, there were certain judgments at the cross. Uh, there was judgments against the flesh, uh, that means that the flesh no longer, no longer has authority over us. The old nature of the flesh is still active within us, but it has no legal authority over us. Satan also at the cross is now a defeated enemy, and he does not hold any legal authority over us either. So those things took place at the cross. Now, this, this session now, we're going to have a look at another area which is how we walk according to this newborn human spirit so every every believer has a has a new spirit it's a new birth taking place now what we see here is that there are two key scriptures to do with this uh, walking according to the newborn human spirit uh, and that deals with this issue here uh, the first one is Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 17. And uh, Paul writes, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are contrary the one to the other, that you may not do the things that you would. Now, while some uh, interpret the Spirit here to be the Holy Spirit, uh, we need to be consistent uh, with the scriptures. And we, if we're consistent and looking into Romans 7, for instance, 
the battle is not between the Holy Spirit and the sin nature. That's not what the, where the battle is, uh, because the Holy Spirit would win every time. The, the battle is between the old nature and the new nature. So we need to, what, what Paul is saying here, the Spirit here is not the Holy Spirit. It is, it, it's in reference to the newborn human spirit. So uh, the battle is between our newborn spirit and the old nature within us. That's where the battleground is. Second passage uh, um, addressing this is also Ephesians chapter 5, verses 7 to 8. Uh, and here Paul again writes, he says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So here we have the concept of how we ought to be walking. And we're supposed to be walking in accordance with the newborn human spirit. And that means to be walking in accordance with the light. And that light is the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we should be walking. Uh, to be walking means to be living consistently within that standard. That, that, uh, that standard is, is the Lord himself. Now, what does it mean to walk in accordance with the newborn human spirit? It means carrying out the duties of the spiritual life that are demanded by the word of God. Uh, at, at, at the core of it, uh, that is what it means to walk on the basis of the newborn human spirit. Now, there are three ramifications to this, and we'll just have a look at those. First of all, the first ramification, it, it says here, and this is, <coughs> it is necessary to carry out life's functions. So what we're saying is that we are required to carry out the daily duties which the Bible demands of us. If we're not fulfilling this, then we're not walking by the newborn human spirit. If we are fulfilling this, then we are walking by the newborn human spirit. So that's the, that's the first thing. First ramification is to, is to carry out the, 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 the duties required of us by the, the word of God. And secondly, to walk physically, you know, we need to have legs and, and feet and exercise and practice and strength, all these things. Balance, all these things involve our body. In the book of Romans, the book of Romans encourages us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And we see that in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And that encourages us to, to cease to present our members, that's the members of the body, as instruments of unrighteousness. So we need to, what we need to do is we need to present our bodies. Um, we need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And uh, we also need to stop uh, presenting our members, you know, our, our functions, if you like, as instruments of unrighteousness. So, so there, there are a couple of things here. Why do we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice? Well, because we are to use them as principles of righteousness in order for us to carry out your duties in the spiritual life that are demanded of us by the word of God. So that's why we need to present our bodies. In order for us to be able to carry out life's functions, we need to use our legs and arms, our hands, our mouth, our mind. And this all requires exercise, practice, strength, balance. Our physical body must be the Lord's. It must be, we must uh, make that um, that one-time dedication of, of ourselves to him as a living sacrifice. That, that is, uh, that is uh, one of the, 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 that's the starting point of being a disciple of Jesus. Now, thirdly, the third ramification here is uh, living the spiritual life. It's, it's, it's a learning process. Um, we then all, all of a sudden, we, we're born again of the spirit, and all of a sudden, we, we know exactly how we ought to live, and, and we can live the spiritual life. It, you know, it's, it's no different than, the, than a, a mother giving birth to a baby, and the baby gets up and goes to work. It doesn't happen like that. We learn by walking. When a little baby begins to walk, 
he or she falls. Why? Because that's what they do. Falling is a part of the learning process. And even so, we are going to fall. Falling is part of our learning process in the spiritual life. If we, the thing though is, is, is that, you know, if we fall, you know, through sin and we never get up, then we have failed to grow spiritually. But it, when we fall and, and we get up, we dust ourselves off and, you know, um, and, and get back on the bike, if you like, and then we're actually growing in the spiritual life. Um, so we need to make sure that we, when we fall, which we will fall, we need to get up here. We get up, we just confess the, the fact that we have sinned against the Lord, confess the fact, get back on the track and keep going. Now, what's the means? What's the, what is the means by which we do this walking, the spiritual walking? Uh, at the very basis of it, it's by faith. And this is brought out in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, where, where Paul, again, Paul is writing here. And he says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk, our, Christ, our believers walk is a walk of faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, faith in God, faith in the word of God. Our spiritual walk, according to the newborn human spirit, is on the basis of our faith. Now, this is in contrast with the way unbelievers do it. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, uh, again, Paul writes here, he says, I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beseech you to walk worthily of the calling wherewith you were called. So Paul beseeches us to keep walking worthily of the calling to which we were called to walk. So the means of walking worthily is to walk by means of faith. And that's how we walk. We are called to, um, there are a couple of things here in regard to the specifics of it. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're called to walk in this newness of life. And we see in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, where it says that we were buried, therefore, with him through baptism into death. This is uh, with Jesus. That like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. So one of the, one of the specifics concerning walking is walking in newness of life. We must now walk in accordance with the divine standard, and not with a standard that may be imposed upon us, either by the old nature of the flesh or the world or the devil. Remember, they're the three, they're the three battlefronts that we have. The old nature of the flesh, the world system, and we have Satan and his demonic forces. So we need to walk in accordance with the divine standard of God. And where do we find that? We find it in, in his word. That's where we find his divine standard. So we need to walk in accordance with the divine standard and not with the standard which outside forces uh, try to force us into. Uh, when I say outside forces, the world system or, or Satan, um, our other great problem is the old nature within us. So we need to Make sure that we, uh, the standard that we're walking in newness of life is in the divine standard. We need to walk properly. And we see this in Romans 13, verse 13, uh, where he said, where Paul, Paul says here, he says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. The point here is that we must walk uh, becomingly or properly, uh, which means avoiding immorality. Immorality is not walking according to the newborn human spirit. Immorality is walking according to the old nature, the old flesh. We must walk properly. We must conduct ourselves as people who walk in the light and not darkness. Uh, we must not engage in any kind of drunkenness and immorality. Uh, we should not have conflicts with one another. 
and we should not be jealous with one another. We shouldn't want something that other people have. That, that's, that's envy and jealousy. So there's no, there's no place for that. We need to walk properly. The third area is walking in good works. And we see this uh, again, Paul writing to the Ephesian church. And he it is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God afore prepared that we should walk in them. So what we see here is that God has prepared a path of good works for believers, which he will perform in and through them as they walk by faith. Now, this does not mean doing a work for God. Instead, it is God performing his work in and through believers. So this is walking according to the newborn human spirit. Uh, doing good works is also in keeping with walking in accordance with the newborn human spirit. The fourth uh, specific we see is it's walking in a worthy manner. And here we see again in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, Paul again writing, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So, because of what God has done for us by means of Christ, we are to walk in a manner worthy of that great calling. As a believer, our conduct concerns both our personal life and our responsibility to other believers within the body of Christ, within the church. So our, our conduct concerns both the personal and corporate life within the church. The fifth thing we see is that we ought to be walking in love. And here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, Paul says, Be ye therefore imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love, even as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for an odor of a sweet smell. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as becomes saints. So, as a child imitates his parents, so we are to imitate God. We are to imitate love. We are to walk in love. Uh, we are to imitate Christ as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. That's how we ought to love. We need to imitate him. And that's, uh, this is one of the specifics in, 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 in demonstrating that we're walking according to this newborn human spirit. We need to Love one another as Christ has loved us. And we know Christ loved us that much that he was prepared to lay down his life for us. And uh, that is one of the, the marks, that is the badge, if you like, of a disciple of Jesus. It's the love. The sixth thing is that we ought to be walking as children of the light. Ephesians 5 verse 8 says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. We have been rescued, you and I, we have been rescued out of darkness. We're no longer part of the darkness. But now as children of light, we ought to walk as children of light. We need to walk circumspectly or carefully. And we see this in Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 16. Paul says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So we are to walk or we are to live very carefully. We need to be applying our Christian wisdom to the practical matters of conduct that face us. How do we do this? By making the right use of every opportunity. And the reason for this careful walk is that the days are evil. So we need to walk carefully. 
there's a, there's a six other scriptures here, uh, you know, where the Bible talks about us walking in connection with the spiritual life. And uh, we have various facets of walking according to this newborn human spirit. And uh, so in Colossians 1.10, it says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. In Colossians 2.6, it says, walk in Christ or in the Messiah. Colossians 4.5, it says, walk in wisdom. First Thessalonians 4.1, he says, walk to please God. And in 1 John 1, 7, he says, walk in the light. And in 3 John 3 to 4, it says, walk in the truth. So there are, uh, there are a couple of, of areas there where it tells us how we are to walk, in what area we're to walk in. Okay. Now, we're just going to look, uh, just going to touch briefly tonight on this, uh, the old versus the new, the old mind versus the new mind. Uh, we'll just look at the old mind tonight and the new mind next week where we finish it off. One of the things we know about the old mind is that it is continually evil. Uh, back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, the, the first instance here where it mentions, it says, Jehovah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So what we see here is that the old mind, the old nature within us is evil. So the basic condition of humanity is said to be corrupt. It's said to be bad, evil, wicked. So this was a universal condition for human beings right throughout the earth. And that is that the old mind is continually evil. We see the old mind is also reprobate because we see in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, it says, and even as they refuse to have God in their knowledge, God gave them up onto a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. So the old mind, the old nature is reprobate. It is morally, morally reprehensible. It expresses itself in attitudes and actions that ought not to be done. So it's a reprobate mind. And the other thing we see, it's death. The old mind is death. It says in uh, Romans 8, verse 6, for the mind of the flesh, the mind of the flesh, flesh is the old nature. For the mind of the old nature is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. So it means that having one's mind set on those things that the old nature desires. That's what, that's what death means. It means having your mind, uh, having one's mind set on the, those things that the old nature desires. Unbeliever cares only for his interests and not for anything to do with God. And that's one of the reasons why the old nature cannot please God in any way. It cannot please God in any way, simply because it has its interest elsewhere. The old nature, the old mind wars against God. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, because the mind of the flesh is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So we see the old mind here is at war with God. The old nature, the old nature rebels against God and will not submit to God's law. But remember, you and I, we have a new nature within us and we have a choice. We can choose to follow the old nature if you want to, but we have a choice. We also have a new nature, which we have the ability and the power to follow. The old mind is conceited. For I say, through the grace that was given me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but so to think as, but so to think, as to think soberly, according as God has dealt to each man a measure of faith. We see this in Romans 12, verse 3. Yeah. So the old mind is conceited. The old mind has the tendency to think more highly of itself than it ought to. Uh, and that's what when we talk about conceited. You know, it, it has a big head. <laughs> now, the old mind is also incapacitated toward God. And we see in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Now, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, 
for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot know them because they're spiritually judged. So the old mind is that it, it, it has a, a total incapacity toward knowing the things of God. The, the old nature cannot know the things of God. The man without the spirit, without the, without the Holy Spirit, uh, an unregenerate person would not and could not receive the message of wisdom regardless of his intellectual abilities or, or accomplishments. He, he, he simply cannot do it without the spirit of God. So it's uh, totally incapacitated toward God. Now also we see the old mind is blinded. And here we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, in whom the God of this world, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not dawn upon them. So 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. So we see the old mind is blinded. The God of this world has blinded the people's mind, making it impossible for them to see the light of the gospel. And as we said before, the God of this world is Satan. So he has blinded their minds. The old mind is empty. Um, we read this in, in Ephesians 4, verse 17. And this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles also walk in the vanity of their mind. You know, he's talking to, um, you know, believers, unbelievers here. The word vanity here also has the meaning of emptiness. So the old mind is an empty mind. The old mind failed to receive the true purpose of the mind, which is to receive God's revelation. It's, uh, it, it, it's empty. It's vain. The old mind is darkened. Uh, in Ephesians 4.18, it says, being darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart. So what we see here is that the old mind is in darkness. Remember, uh, once a person is born again, they now become children of the light not children of the darkness. So this mind, this darkened mind, does not have the ability to understand spiritual truth because spiritual truth has to be spiritually discerned and that requires the Holy Spirit. The old mind is earthly and what we see in Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, their end is destruction, their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So the old mind is earthly. The old mind sets itself on earthly things rather than heavenly things. So the old mind is set on the things of the flesh, the old nature. Well, the old mind is also fleshly or carnal. It says in, in uh, Colossians uh, chapter 2, Verse 18 to 19, it says, Let no man rob you of your prize by a voluntary humility and worshipping of the angels, dwelling in the things which he has seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to head, from whom all the body being supplied and knit together through the joints and bands increases with the increase of God. So the old mind is fleshly or carnal. It is not of the spirit. It's in rebellion against God. The old mind is always in rebellion against God. The old nature is always in rebellion against God. The last thing is the old mind is defiled. And we see this in Titus chapter 1, verse 15. Titus writes, To the pure all things are pure, but to them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. So the old mind is defiled, it is corrupted. So what we see here is that these 12 things are true of the old mind. It, it is evil, it is reprobate, it's death, it's at war with God, it's conceited, it's incapacitated toward God, it's blinded, it's empty, it's darkened, it's earthly, it's fleshly or carnal, 
and it's defiled. Now, insofar as the unbeliever is concerned, that is the only mind that he has. But we who are believers, we still have this mind in us, but this is not the only mind that we have. We have two natures, remember? The old nature and the new nature. So this old mind is of the old nature. And uh, next week, we'll just wrap this whole spiritual warfare up and we'll look at the new nature. And that is the lot for tonight.